Now, we, we mentioned, you know, last week just this idea of uh, that there's no evidence for Darwinian evolution, uh, although it is uh, often taught as a fact as opposed to a theory. Uh, a good friend of mine for a number of years taught biology at one of the community colleges, and I asked him about that. Do you teach it as fact or as a theory? He says, well, I just teach it as a theory so that I can use it to teach the scientific model. That's it. I said, you're aware, though, that a lot of people teach it as fact. He goes, yeah. And, uh, uh, and even he didn't, you know, realize, he didn't really understand why they did that because there really isn't enough evidence to support it as, as a fact at all. And, uh, and of course, uh, seeing that last week, I also realized that some people, this is like shocking information because they've never even heard any rebuttal or any other information or the, the mounds and mounds of, uh, of evidence and information that's available to us to support the idea of intelligent design. One of the things that it takes for Darwinian evolution uh, to be true is for random selection to be able to create life out of, uh, out of nothing. And of course, our text began that in the beginning, God created. So again, created as bara. It's only used of God creating things, and it's creating something out of nothing. And, uh, and only God can do that. And that's the only reasonable explanation for we see the beginning of life. I uh, want to, we'll follow this up with a couple of Wednesday nights of some very good DVDs on the subject. If you're more interested in the details and some of the uh, scientific uh, experts uh, as they explain why you can't get something from nothing and why uh, it takes intelligent design or someone from the outside to come in to create life. But I uh, wanted to show you uh, this morning a little video clip from Ben Stein's movie, Expelled, which is a, a very good documentary. Uh, and, uh, and in it, in this clip, he's just dealing with this idea of the uh, mathematical odds and their impossibility of just random acts somehow aligning the protein molecules and molecules in such a way as to uh, have that first cell of life created. It's, uh, uh, it's a little funny and hopefully be informative. What were the chances of life arising on its own? It's been speculated that probably there would have to be a minimum of about 250 proteins to provide minimal life function. Um, if that's really true, uh, then I think it's, it's almost inconceivable that life could have happened in some simple step-by-step -step way. Okay, so the simplest form of life requires at least 250 proteins to function. What's so difficult about that? Welcome to the Casino of Life. Who wants to spin for a chance to win? Oh, sure. I'll give it a shot. What do I win? Take a look at this. Huh? How about the world's first single-cell organism? This perfectly aligned string of proteins could be yours. Now, take a spin. I won. <laughs> Tina, tell him how many times he needs to do that to win the prize. 250. That's right, folks, and all in the correct order. But that's impossible. <laughs> We've heard that before, haven't we, Richard? Come on, Mother Nature, do your thing. Uh... You stupid machine! Uh, I hate you! We're talking about something that's staggeringly improbable, roughly one in a trillion, 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 trillion. Let all of life choose a million, a trillion, a trillion, trillion. The number is z essentially zero. Something has to skew nature to choose the ones that work. So, in the game of life, it looks as if the house always wins. Luckily, some serious scientific minds have figured out a way to beat the odds. Directed panspermia. When faced with the overwhelming problem of the origin of life, Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick proposed this theory, that life was seeded on Earth, which basically means aliens did it. Crystals? Aliens? I thought we were talking about science, not science fiction. 
scientists and, of course, interviewing the scientists that have been removed from their positions from the Smithsonian to NASA, different places, simply because they wrote an article or said something about intelligent design. And, um, and it's just one of those things, if, if, you, if you even begin to even say something about it, then uh, not only are you ridiculed uh, in the press and in scientific journals, very often you're fired and removed from position. It's not one of those things you're allowed to even, even address. It was just a few years ago in, in Kansas that, um, if you remember, they wanted to teach intelligent design along with the theory of evolution, and there was like riots in the streets practically because of this, uh, uh, this notion that uh, these two things could be taught side by side. After all, if you let those Christians in, they'll be burning all the textbooks next, and it was just like mayhem in, in the streets. But uh, God's very clear in his word, and one other uh, word of, uh, of caution, and again, we'll, we'll kind of... Uh, provide more information as we, uh, as we go along, like I said, on Wednesday nights. But as we get now to the days of creation, uh, there's lots of views on the days of creation. I'm going to give you uh, uh, six, actually. Of course, I'm going to give you the, the real view, my view, uh, but uh, at the end and make a case for it. But uh, uh, there's a lot of different views. And, and the whole point is that uh, uh, it's okay to have all these views that uh, nobody's salvation is resting upon their view of creation. Their salvation is resting certainly that God created uh, and so forth, but that he sent his son, died for our sins. It's that message of redemption that people must uh, really uh, understand and receive. When I'm trying to lead somebody to the Lord, I really don't care about their view. I, I want to make sure they understand the universe had a, begin, a beginning, therefore it had a beginner. That beginner is God. He is the first cause. And the question then, is he noble? And yes, he is noble. He's revealed himself to us through the person of Jesus Christ and through the resurrection. And I can give them the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then it's a question of whether they will place their faith in his death and resurrection for them. I want to see them one to the Lord and know that they're going to spend eternity in heaven. Whether I ever convince them of my particular view of uh, the days of creation is really, again, what we would call a non-eternal issue. So uh, that's something that's uh, uh, important to point out. But for me, I'm just going to do my best to teach you the text, allow the text to, to, to uh, uh, either, uh, again, speak to your heart or not, but you'll, you'll have to kind of make that uh, decision. What we don't differ on in terms of God's word is, is that the Genesis account uh, are factual and historical, that Adam and Eve are special creations of God, and that when Adam and Eve sin, uh, sinned, death and sin entered to the world to all mankind. So there's a, a, a host of people that I can mention that are on the side of a, a literal 24-hour period for creation, uh, versus one of the other viewpoints that I'm going to give you. And uh, time really doesn't permit me to, uh, to go through the list that I've got here. Uh, but just to say, even with all of the great theologians on both sides of the issue, they all agree on those things. Uh, Moses writes in Exodus 20, 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And that's the bottom line, that God created uh, everything. David Hawking, in his book, The Rise and Fall of Civilization, says it all began with the six days of creation, and everything that we see and know to be in, in existence had its beginning when God created it all. That's one thing that the, uh, the Bible is very clear on. So the six views of the six days of creation. I know this is kind of very academic and tough for Super Bowl Sunday, so uh, see if you can stay with me. One is the 24-hour solar day uh, in which creation took place, therefore in 144 hours. The literal view, or what we might call the young earth view. Second is the, um, none of this will be on the final, don't worry, but just to make you aware of some of the views. And some of these views, folks here hold. The punctuated activity view, that there's literally 24-hour periods where God does this, but you have uh, those days separated by time periods where you try to, uh, and the attempt there is to try to reconcile the Bible with, the, with uh, what we can observe and see in, in science. Because keep in mind that, that um, 
uh, the Bible, either way you slice it, contradicts and does not stand with the idea that the earth is billions and billions of years old. That's based on what scientists can see and observe. Because what they will do, and the reason that date keeps changing, when I was in school, it was millions of years old, then it got to be 10 billion, then 50, I think it's up to 60 billion. And that's based on the fact that we have better telescopes these days. Because light travels you know, at a certain speed, therefore if I can see a star that's this far away, I can calculate how long did it take light to get there so that I can see it, and then I can calculate how long that star has been in, in existence. So the better telescopes, I'm seeing stars further and further away. That number keeps increasing. So based on science and what can be observed, scientists would tell us that the universe now today is about 60 billion, but with better technology, that, that number would, uh, would grow based on that. So you, either, either way, whatever view you take, you're not gonna be able to really reconcile a biblical view completely with what you can see and observe through scientific study alone. There's the gap theory that I mentioned, number three, that I mentioned last week, that between Genesis 1-1, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, uh, and they were without uh, form and they were void. And therefore, uh, there are those that would say, since they were without form and they were without void, and then you have God speak in the days of creation, then in the following verses, there's a gap in time and then they uh, uh, insert into that all of these uh, uh, stories and, uh, about uh, that's when, you know, in the primeval world, that's when Satan fell and that's when this happened and that's when that happened. And it took millions and billions of years old. So you have a tremendous gap between those verses. Uh, and therefore, you have the explanation of why the universe is billions of years old. And, and there's an attempt to try to align, again, what you can see and study from science with what we find in Scripture. But as we mentioned last week, I put my very best reading glasses on. I held the Bible as close as I could get to my reading glasses and I couldn't see anything written between those two verses. Uh, it's, it's an argument out of silence. There, there's nothing there. And in fact, as we get further in the text, I'll at least temp, attempt to show you that uh, uh, the text is meant to, to go together coherently together uh, and not uh, some kind of separation. Four is the day-age view, which understands the days corresponding to geological ages. We have different geological uh, ages in dating the earth and the universe. And, uh, and there's a, uh, an attempt to assign days to that structure and so forth. The problem with that is that it's contradictory. They don't line up uh, at all. Uh, and that's a tough, I wouldn't want to try to debate somebody holding that uh, view, put it that way. Five, the, the framework view which says that uh, Moses writes this, uh, it's a piece of literature, uh, it's an allegory. Uh, creation was so complex and took so long and there was so much involved, God couldn't have possibly try to, through Moses, explain it to everybody and the Israelites living in uh, his day and age. So he, he uses a story to tell the idea of creation and the fall and the flood. But again, uh, the problem with that is that that's not the way Moses wrote, wrote it. It's written as a historical narrative, uh, and uh, that's, that's a very, very tough position to defend as well. And then the uh, analogical day view, uh, which basically says that it was six days that God did everything, but God's days are not the same as man's days. And then they quote Peter, who says that, that uh, uh, a thousand years to us is like a day to the Lord, which is not a mathematical equation. It's just to say God doesn't measure time the way we measure time. Therefore, when he says it was a day, it doesn't really mean it's a day like it is to us. Um, if, if you're gonna, if you're gonna uh, my, my suggestion, if you have to debate this uh, to your own conscience and be able to sleep at night and not wrestle something from the text, and you can't accept this idea that God can speak everything into existence, fully mature, fully aged, then uh, pick that view. I think that's your, 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 your best uh, other shot. Uh, I don't hold it myself, and I'm gonna give you five reasons why uh, in just a moment. But uh, before we even get to that, the analysis of the text itself is interesting uh, and helps us understand a little bit of why we need to read this all as, uh, as one unit together. 
kind of refuting this idea of the gap theory. Well, the arrangement of the text. Uh, with a quick read, you realize that the six days are divided into three days, answering the question, the earth was without uh, form. And so the first three days of, co of creation deal with forming the, the earth. Uh, and we'll see that in a moment as we uh, continue to go through it. The other three days deal with filling it. It was without form, and it was void, it was empty. So then the days of creation answer that question and go right together with it and tell us this is how God formed it, and this is how God filled it. Uh, one, to day, one to three days, and then the day four to six. And then the correspondence in, in the text itself is also interesting. Day one corresponds to day <coughs> four. Uh, three, uh, four, excuse me, day two to five and three to six. Just to give you an, an example of that, um, day one, light is created. On, on day four, the sun and the moon rule the light. Uh, on day two, God creates the expanse that is called the sky, separating the waters above from the waters below. And on day five, he fills the sky with birds and he fills uh, the waters with fish. On day three, God separates water from dry land, creating vegetation. And on day six, he fills the land with animal life and eventually creates man. So all these things correspond one to another. And then the numerical value is interesting. Also, the late uh, Hebrew uh, University professor Umberto Casuto points out that uh, Moses uses the number seven. And if you study Hebrew literature, it's not uncommon to see uh, numbers uh, involved in interesting ways. He says that, quote, the work of the creator, which is marked by absolute perfection, flawless systematic orderliness, is distributed over seven days, six days of labor, and the seventh day set aside for the enjoyment of the completed task. And then he talks about the word for God, Elohim, that we mentioned last week, heavens, uh, Samaim, and then earth, Eretz, are the three nouns in the opening verse in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then they're repeated in multiples of seven. God occurs 35 times, heavens occurs uh, 21 times, earth occurs 21 times. In addition, on the Hebrew original, the first verse has seven words, the second uh, verse, 14 words, the seventh paragraph, uh, the seventh day, has, has uh, three sentences, each of which has seven words, and contains in the middle phrase, the seventh day. Uh, we could go on and on, but it's just interesting the, uh, the symmetry as well as how intricately encoded uh, God's word is at times in, in, uh, in Moses' writing. Uh, he goes on and says this numerical symmetry, as it were, the goal is the golden thread that binds together all the parts of the section and serves as a convincing proof of its unity, no gaps, no separation. It's written with perfect uh, symmetry. And then the historical style of the text, it's written again, it's not written so that you could take from it and say it's simply uh, an allegory, or it's just a storytelling device so that we can understand a little bit of creation, because after all, it's too complex for us to really comprehend. I don't think we can fully comprehend God speaking the universe into existence, but that's not the problem with the text. That view doesn't hold up because there are certain tenses in the Hebrew verbs that would have been used that are not there. And what is there is a, is a literal narrative, just like you find when, it's, when Moses is describing the Jews leaving Egypt, when they're going into the land, anytime he's telling the historical facts of what happened to the Jewish people. It's the same language that he uses here. Francis Schaeffer, the great theologian, says the mentality of the whole scripture is that creation is, is as historically real as the history of the Jews in our present moment of time. Both the Old and the New Testaments deliberately root themselves back into the early chapters of Genesis insisting that they are a record of historical events. So that allegorical view, it just textually, it, it isn't there. Uh, and, and all I want to say is that you, you can choose one of these other views. You just can't say the Bible teaches them. 
And, and, and there's where I, I would have a problem. I mean, we're all free to, to, to choose this. There's certain elements that we have to agree with that God created, that Adam and Eve were special creations, and that they fell and rebelled against God. Therefore, sin enters into this world, to creation itself, and into all mankind. How that happens, we can disagree. But again, some of those areas where we may have disagreements, we're really wrestling with the, the text itself. Uh, and again, what is Moses doing here? He's trying to also deal with the, the pagan religions of his day that says that we should worship the sun. Remember, that was one of the gods in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, we should worship this river and that tree and so forth. And God is saying right from the beginning, no, I created them. They are not divine. They are not to be worshipped in any way. And that was really what so much of, of paganism was about. We need to worship the God of the harvest if we're going to have a good harvest. And God's going to say, no, I created all the plants. You know, we need to worship the God of fertility if we're going to be able to have children. No, I'm the one that created life. I'm the one that gives life. So in writing this, Moses is actually given an apologetic, we might say, for the people of God to be able to say, no, you're wrong. This can't be true. Uh, God is the one that created everything. And of course, we live in a day and age where we're going back to that, aren't we? We're, I was just watching a movie the other night where it was, uh, 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 there was lots of references to Mother Earth uh, in, uh, in the movie and, uh, and so forth. And uh, we have uh, you know, a whole religious system that's developing around uh, the idea of Gaia and the worship of Mother Earth. We worship the, as Paul says, people choose to worship the creation rather than the creator, he says, who is to be praised forevermore. So right from the beginning of the count, uh, we constantly see Moses writing as God inspires uh, and telling us that uh, the creator is the one truly to be worshipped. Uh, again, reasons for believing in, that I want to give you in, in a literal 24-hour day creation. Now, I, again, I hold this view, and some of you may not, and uh, so you can just bear with me, but... Uh, uh, maybe just uh, hear me out in terms of what the text actually says, because uh, I think it's, it's hard to deviate from, from the text. And, uh, and, and here's, here's, the, here's the problem or the issue. To choose another view, because I'll show you, this is just what the text says, uh, that it's a literal 24-hour day, and there are six of them, but God did it, and that he literally spoke everything fully mature right from the beginning when he created trees it will say he treated tree excuse me created them with fruit and the seed in them they're they're not little sprouts there's not little seeds that have to grow up everything is fully uh, fully mature already and to say that God says this but then he meant this he says it but he actually he, he meant it this way which is <clears throat> what some of these other views hold then we have a we have a lot of apologizing to do for a lot of the other views that we have in the Bible of liberals, they would say, well, it says hell, but there's really not a real hell. He just meant that there's a lot of punishment in this life and so forth. Uh, you know, Jesus, it says that he rose from the dead. It doesn't mean that he literally rose from the dead. It's the idea that his teaching, his spirit kind of lives on. So, we, so if we begin to deviate and say the Bible says this, but it means something else, well, that's what the liberals say in most of their theological points in conversation. That's also what our Reformed brothers say when it comes to prophecy. Well, the church is spiritual Israel. It says Israel, but it doesn't really mean Israel because now the church is Israel. It doesn't literally mean this prophecy is going to be fulfilled, that Israel will be back in the land. That's not a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We're all happy for them and so forth. Uh, but the Bible says this, but it means this. Do you see what I mean? If we begin right from chapter 1, verse 1, to begin to look at Scripture and says it says this, but it means something else, we're going we're gonna to go down a path where we're going to find ourselves uh, in, in a lot of trouble and having to give a, a, a difficult explanation to others uh, when it comes to real essentials uh, of Jesus' resurrection and things that mean uh, everything to us in terms of our eternity. So that in mind, and I'm uh, actually taking these, uh, these five reasons, again, right from uh, Dr. Hawking, from his book, The Rise and Fall of Civilization, that uh, now has been reprinted. I've got the old version reprinted as the beginning, if you would want to 
get that online off his website and, uh, and read that for yourselves. But uh, it goes like this. Uh, reason number one, uh, the normal usage of the word day. It's Hebrew, it's yom. And remember we said when you want to make something plural in Hebrew, you add the I-M. Cherub, cherubim, seraph, seraphim. So yom, yomim. Anytime yom or yomim are used for day or days uh, in the Old Testament, they are used 1,900 times. Uh, and there's an exception of 65 times when they don't mean a literal 24-hour day. And that's where some would get, well, see, there is a little exception here. I mean, there's 1,900 times, and there's 65 times it's not used as a literal day. So since there's sometimes it's not used as a literal day, this is one of those occasion, and it just means a period of time. And if that's all we had, I would say those guys have a very good argument. But, but we would also say, <laughs> yeah, but the other 1,800 and something times, uh, it's always used as a literal day. Add to that then the use of the numerical adjective as in chapter 1, verse 5, God called the, uh, the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day, a numerical value added worth with yom or yomim. That occurs 700 times and every time without exception, it always means a literal 24-hour day period, no exception. So you have this word that is overwhelmingly used to talk about a literal 24-hour period. And then when there's a numerical value added to that, then it is always talking about a, a literal 24-hour period. That, and that's why I say that uh, you, can, you can hold the view that, that it means a longer period of time, uh, but, you have, but you're going to have to kind of wrestle that away from the text because the text is pretty clear itself. And then you have the phrase evening and morning, which simply means, some would say, beginning and ending. So at the beginning and the ending of this time period. But again, how is it used in other places? Well, one example is in Daniel 8.14, where Daniel is writing, and uh, it says, And he said to me, for 2,300 days, there's our word in question, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That word days there is not uh, yomin is actually the same word for, uh, for evening and morning. When that word evening and morning is used, it's still talking about a 24-hour period. So you've got a word that is almost always a 24-hour period, yom or yomin. You've got a numerical value added to it, first day, second day, third day, fourth day. And every time there's an occurrence, it's always a 24-hour period. And then you've got evening uh, and morning, and then, and then the day. Uh, so it's, it's just the text itself. It's pretty hard to, to not say that it's not saying a literal 24-hour day. You can say you disagree with that, but you have to disagree with the text. And uh, I, I just don't want to do that. Number four, the relationship of the days of creation to the six-day work week. Uh, and uh, that's recorded for us. Again, Moses still writing in Exodus 28. Remember the Sabbath day or the Shabbat. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So uh, why is man required to work six days and then rest on the seventh? Moses says it's because God created everything uh, in six days. You say, I only have to work five days. You're in semi-retirement then. But uh, so just, uh, you know, thank God every day that you get that uh, two days off uh, off a week. Uh, and again, in, in a Jewish mind, when does the day start? At sundown, right? Because it's all based on, uh, on this account here in Scripture. Even in Israel today, they don't say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, because those are names of Greek gods. That's where we get that, that, that idea of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. They say first day of the week, second day of the week, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and the Shabbat. 
when, when God rested. Their whole calendar and their whole existence is built around, and their work week uh, is from the account of creation it, uh, itself. And, uh, and we can learn a lot from that. If you think about Sunday, the day that we worship because of the fulfillment of a Jewish feast when Jesus rose from, from the dead, we worship on the uh, first day of the week. Uh, if we think about it starting at sundown the night before, you'll never be late for, for a church because, uh, because Sunday starts when the sun goes down the night before and you're going to be thinking, what should I wear? What are the kids going to eat in the morning? Because it's Sunday, we're getting ready here. I'm just throwing it out as a suggestion. But uh, everything evolves around, and the work week in Scripture is based on the six days of creation. <clears throat> and then five, the relationship of the Sabbath or the Shabbat. Uh, those that argue for long days or God's days not being the same as man days point out that God created the seventh day, and yet he continues to work. So that, that day just goes on and on and on. Therefore, we can have very long days. In Genesis 2, verse 2, it says, On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. And again, so they would say that, and God continues to work. Since God continues to work, that day, that seventh day, just keeps going on and on and on, Therefore, these days are long periods of time. But uh, God does continue to work in the history of the world, story of redemption uh, in, uh, in our lives, but he rested from creation, uh, and that's the idea. It ended there. Again, David Hawking says, the Sabbath day is a period of 24 hours. It's based on the seventh day of creation, the day God ended his work of creating. So, again, I don't want to... Not my intention to, to ruffle anyone's feathers. It's a non-eternal issue. But at the same time, I just want to say, this is what the text says. So you just kind of have to deal with it. And also realize that uh, it does not agree with uh, the idea of evolution and how things came about. It doesn't agree with the sequence of events. And we'll, as we get into the text, and yes, we will get into the text in a moment, uh, you'll see it just doesn't line up with the... Uh, the sequence of events necessary for Darwinian evolution, because I know there's uh, folks out there that hold what's called theistic evolution. They believe that, that God kind of stirred the pot and kept evolution going, recognizing that uh, random chance selection, as we saw in the, uh, the video, uh, is uh, impossible, uh, and God had to create those protein molecules, and that God had to create a transitional form, and God had to create and, and kind of helped it along through these millions and millions and billions of years old. Uh, but again, if you hold that view, then you're saying that, that I, don't know what you, I don't know what you do with the text, because the text is actually uh, very clear, and the text contradicts scientific observable facts. It does. The text also contradicts Darwinian evolution. You're going to have to decide basically what you're going to believe. I think it's a problem, a real problem, to try to merge these, these two thoughts together. But that's something a lot of people struggle with. Again, the punctuated activity view, uh, that there's uh, indefinite periods in between, is not in the text. It has to be inserted. The gap view uh, is an argument out of silence. The day-age view, <coughs> corresponding to geological ages, if you look at that, they don't agree with the biblical account. In fact, they're contradictory to each other. The framework view, the idea of a, it's a, a literary device, uh, which I was talking to somebody after last week, and he holds that view. But again, but the language in the text doesn't bear it out. There's language in Hebrew. Verb tense is used for that. Uh, they're never used here. And the analogical day view, that God's days are not the same as man's days. If you have to try to argue for an old earth versus a young earth, I recommend that position. I think that's the one that you can best argue from without wrestling the text out of its context and trying to come up with something that matches evolutionary thought. I don't hold that view uh, simply for the reasons that I've, I've just given you. Well, let's go on to the forming of the world in creation. And we've got uh, day one in creation in verses three to four. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. 
And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the, uh, the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So uh, as mentioned, uh, the earth is uh, without form. So now God is bringing formation uh, to it. And, and notice how many times the phrase is repeated, then God said, verse 3, verse 9, verse 11, 14, 20, 24, 26, and 29. Don't have to have those numbers memorized. It's so the point is, that's how God creates. He spoke everything into existence uh, by his speech. Uh, Philip Johnson says, The vast universe was shaped by his thought and will, as was each of the trillions of cells in our body, each cell's nucleus containing a coded database larger in information content than all 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia uh, Britannica. So for the first days, the first three days, there was a light source other than the sun. Again, if you're uh, an evolutionist or a theistic evolutionist, this is a real problem because how do, you, how do you have light without the sun? As we'll see in a moment, how do you have vegetation with, without the sun unless God miraculously, by his power, spoke these things into being? Well, I also find it interesting that, again, God is the light source himself. And if I can get to my last point before the Super Bowl starts, which could be in question at this point unless I speed up, we'll get to see that Jesus is, is that light. And that's part of his, his declaration uh, in, uh, in John. But uh, at the end of the earth, as it's created, God is its light source. And at the end, God will be his, the light source as well. Revelation 22, verse 5, uh, there will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. In the end, uh, and when we're all living in the new Jerusalem and we have the recreation of everything, there is no sun. God is our light source, even as from the beginning. And again, what does that say to the pagan religions around them? That God created these things uh, and they are not to be worshiped. Day two, creation, verses 68. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the, the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Again, to quote uh, uh, Kasuto, he says, the expanse or the ragia signifies a kind of horizontal area extending through the very heart of the mass of water, dividing it into two layers, one above the other, creating upper and lower layers of water. So God creates and separates this water mass uh, that uh, is now uh, to planet Earth and, uh, and separated and, and above it. And, uh, and of course, a phenomenal description of Earth's atmosphere as viewed from Earth uh, heaven, again, not to be confused with the sun and the moon and the stars. They haven't been created yet. But heaven is uh, in a plural form here. And, uh, and that's what we find Paul saying in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, 3, where he says, I know a man in Christ who was 14 years ago. Where they're in the body, I do not know. Where they're out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Paul really in a rabbinical form, talking about himself, this experience that he had with the Lord. And when he says, I'm caught up to the third heaven, he's in the presence of God. So very simply, we can look above. One way of looking at this, we can see the blue skies above us and say, um, look at the heavens that, that are above us. And yet at the same time, we can go out at night and see much further into the atmosphere and see stellar space. And uh, we would say the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, we see that as, as the heavens as well. And yet at the same time, we know that God's throne dwell, is in heaven, which is in a different, uh, different dimension altogether. So the word heaven is used plural here and uh, separating these, uh, the water one from another. In terms of him naming them day uh, and night, uh, in sky. It's just speaking to the fact that he has dominion over them. Later, he's going to then create Adam and Eve. He's going to create Adam, and he's going to tell him to name the animals. It's not just to give Adam something to do. 
to pass his time until Eve is created, it's because he's saying he's giving dominion over him. Just like when you get that new puppy, whoever picks the name is the one that's going to have to clean up because he's going to get dominion. Is that how it works in your house? But uh, uh, naming gives you dominion and rule, and that's what we see here. We'll see it with Adam later. Day three in creation. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth. So these things are cr created completely mature. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed, according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. So during the first two days of creation, there's an increasing order that's brought. On day three, he speaks twice, uh, completes the forming uh, of the earth. Uh, no new creation, but a final ordering. Uh, the waters are separated. Uh, and with the second word on the third day, he switches now to the fullness as plant life comes into uh, ex existence. And, and again, so this is contradictory to uh, evolutionary thought or theistic evolutionary thought, however you want to, to look at it, because you need the sun to exist before plant life can exist, unless you believe that God himself is that light, and you have tw simply 24-hour period before uh, or a few days before the sun comes, uh, then you, there's not an issue with the survival of plants uh, without the sunlight themselves. You've also got um, plant life existing prior to uh, marine organisms coming about, which again is completely contradictory to uh, evolutionary thought. But uh, again, here the gods of the earth, the vegetation, fertility, and so forth are dismissed by these words of Moses because, again, they are created they are, uh, by God. They are not uh, to be worshipped themselves. Listen to how uh, later the psalmist writes about in Psalm 104, this idea of this separation of forming of the earth. Uh, you laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. The waters receded into the earth. As scientists uh, tell us today, they have. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over that they may not return to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them, the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. Their earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. So uh, again, just a note, by the time we get to talk about the worldwide flood, we just note that uh, when God created, there was water covering the earth, and now he has taken that water and caused it to reseed into caverns into the earth. And when it comes time for a worldwide flood, God brings it back and covers the earth uh, again. And, uh, and I think that we, we do know now scientifically that that, that is uh, absolutely possible with the amount of water uh, that is on the earth's surface uh, and in the interior of uh, of the earth, but we have this separation. We have uh, dry land. So without form, now we have formation with void. It's empty, but now we have uh, uh, the filling. I uh, just the last thing, maybe the most important thing, is seeing Christ in in creation. And first, we see that he is the he is the light. And Jesus makes this declaration uh, in, uh, in John chapter 8. But the background on that is very, very important, what he's saying, and we can miss it, and it really ties in with what we're saying right here. Uh, the Jews would celebrate one of their three main feasts, and one of them was a feast of Sukkoth or Tabernacles, usually in about October. Uh, and uh, Jews around the world will today take, take their uh, family and move outside, build a little booth out there and so forth, and live outside uh, for a week. 
uh, when we do that in Hawaii, we call it vacation. <laughs> but uh, they, they do it at some of you are going, I don't think we ever did that. Well, we did it every year down at the beach. But uh, <clears throat> a few people are nodding. I camp. I get it. But uh, they move out, and, and it's so they can remind their kids, why are we living out here instead of in our home? Because we're remembering that, that uh, the Jews wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, but God watched over us, and God protected us, and now he brought us into the land of Israel, the land flowing with, uh, with milk uh, and honey. Uh, the honey from the, the date orchards that were there, the sweetness of that that we enjoy, uh, and the milk because there's pasture land that our goats and lambs can, uh, can go out in. He's going to provide everything for us, and we are celebrating what God did for us and delivering us from uh, that period of time. One of the things they did in the temple area was to light a, their uh, huge golden menorah uh, there in the evening because God led them and guided them through uh, a, a fire at night and, a, and a, a pillar of cloud by the day. So they would like that to remind themselves. Josephus tells us that you could see this thing glowing for miles and miles away. Again, as Jerusalem is kind of up on a plateau and then you've got this burning uh, candle abra. And it's in the midst of that candle abra burning and the focus on the fact that that represents God, that represents the fact that he led us and he guided us and that he is the light that has watched over us and brought us into the land. And in that context, in John 8, then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus says, that light is me. And he takes the name of God that God gives to Moses, the I am, the eternal one. I am the eternal one, and I am the light. I am the one that led you all the way, the one that brought you into the land. And I am also then the one who is the light of Genesis 1. So when we see Jesus as his part in creation, and we talk about the fact that well, what lit up the world apart from the sun, the moon, and the stars. It was Jesus. And that's what we see in the end in Revelation 20, 22. I don't know if that blesses you, but uh, uh, it, it does me. Uh, and uh, secondly, he says that he is the creator. Uh, in John 1, 1, the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And of course, in verse 14, John says, uh, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But uh, so he is identified as the word. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus is the light of and Jesus is the creator. And we mentioned that the first week in the beginning, God, Elohim, compound unity. Uh, and later we see that let us make man in our image and our likeness. We see the, the uh, triunity of God in the beginning. Paul says in Col uh, Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created of Jesus, that in heaven that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So he's the light, he is the creator, and therefore he's the one that brings order. Everything is without order, and God brings order to them. And my whole point is, if he can do that to the universe, he can do that in our lives. Your life may seem chaotic and out of order, and it also may seem empty or void. And the only thing that really fills our life or brings any order to our life is to know Jesus Christ. And the only thing that truly takes us out of darkness and into the light, the light, is Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings us out of the, the chaos and the lostness that is uh, out there in the world. So when you look at the stars tonight, uh, it might be raining, but the next time you look at the stars, the next time you, uh, you look at a, a big day on the North Shore or whatever it might be, that is some epic visual that we have here uh, in the islands. It might just be the, uh, the sunrise out there over the Mokes or, 
or seeing the uh, ko'olals on a, on a clear day. Remember that Jesus created all of that out of nothing. He simply spoke it into existence, and he's the one that can, he can change us and change our lives. He's redeemed us. He saved us. But he's the God that can save a person from a drug addiction, from a horrible past life, uh, all the things that we think about that are the horrendous things that we face in our own lives. And we think if we just had the faith to believe and trust in Jesus Christ, can he do it? Will he do it? He certainly has the power to, and he certainly loves us because Paul says, yet while we were sinners, Christ died for our sins. We should never question the love that God has for any one of us. He loves us. He wants to work in our lives, and he certainly has the power to work in our lives. And a lot of this is a little bit academic, but these are the things that come under attack on a regular basis from people outside the world that don't know the Lord, don't know the things we're talking about, that attempts to destroy our faith. And, uh, and we just need to understand literally what God says in his word because we can trust it. We need to hold to it. I don't know what your view is on, on any of these things, but as a Christian, you should hold that God spoke creation into existence, uh, that he did it all on his own, uh, and that he specifically created Adam and Eve, and that they fell and sin entered the world. And then the promise to them is that he would bring someone, a redeemer, that would save us from our sins. And we'll get to that when we get to, to Genesis 3. But this morning is the first Sunday of the month, and... Um, so we're going to have communion together. And um, as we do that, it's a great time to think about what the Lord has done. And maybe it's a good time to pray to the Lord what you would desire him to do. Maybe issues in your life, the things that you're struggling with, or uh, the issues of uh, really not being able to come to grips with, can God really change this in me? Can God really work do I keep praying? Do I keep persevering for that family member or those friends around me? Well, yes, you should, uh, because uh, we're going to take these elements that remind us of his tremendous love for us. As we've just studied, he certainly has the, the power. Paul says that the same power that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in each and us. Born to make a sound, giving life to live it out. Opening our eyes to the life that's all around. Throw your broken heart away. This is a new day. Love is all around. There's a new way. Walk strong, walking in the light of the love. Oh, Brad, the spirit lead the way, sing a song. 
Oh, 